Welcome to our research fellowship presentation meeting. If you're joining us for the first time today, I am Deepsha Biswas, the Bioinformatics Community Manager at Pine Biotech. The research project program has been designed to help young researchers and students take advantage of the bioinformatics resources for analysis of complex high throughput life science data and become versed in bioinformatics. This program offers you to participate in real and cutting edge bioinformatics research and be part of a renowned bioinformatics. The research fellowship is a program for independent research projects where we learn about the application of bioinformatics to big high throughput omics data, mastering the TBIO info cloud-based bioinformatics platform, understanding of NGS data, expertise with biostatistical tools and machine learning concepts, effective use of functional annotation and biological interpretation, cutting edge research with supervised and unsupervised multi-omics integration, apply tools to interpret meaningful insights and start your own bioinformatics NGS project. And these are the different research areas that we focus on, like oncology, virology, neuroscience, microbiome and agriculture, data science, and machine learning. I would like to invite Dr. Mohit Mazumdar, our Omics Logic Project Guide at Pine Biotech to talk more about the bioinformatics research. Dr. Mazumdar, over to you. Thank you, uh, Bipsha. Okay. Hello, everyone. So let me share my screen. Uh, yeah, so today I wanted to talk to you all about uh, the uh, research fellowship program and what we are actually doing in this program in the term in 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 the sense of projects and the research that we are conducting with uh, our fellows here who have joined this meeting as well. So to give uh, to give you a background. Over the past 20 years, there has been a phenomenal growth in the adoption of high throughput technologies like next generation sequencing in research, biotechnology, and clinical practice. So these technologies uh, produced exponential uh, growth of publicly available omics data, right? So this trend produced has produced many exciting challenges that could be solved that could be solved by extracting this sort of information and knowledge from this data. So uh, for example, to learn about the nature of malignant processes and the relationship between clinical, uh, between clinical phenotypes and their, molecular, uh, and their molecular drivers. That's an example. So this process of uh, posting relevant data for pressing research needs has also been uh, accelerating including a major increase in public sharing of omics data during this ongoing pandemic. So importantly, this sharing of data is just not about the biological phenomenon, but in depth view of actually, you know, what's going on. So at a molecular level, if you want to understand this data, which we are talking about and analyzing every day is called or referred as the omics data. So today I wanted to also give you an example in the context of uh, maybe precision oncology or precision medicine. So precision medicine aims to empower clinicians, especially to predict the most appropriate course of action for you know, patients uh, with complex diseases such as uh, cancer, diabetes, uh, cardiomyopathy, COVID-19. So so with, a pro with this progressive you know, interpretation of clinical data and then um, molecular data and then genomic factors that are at play in many of these diseases. So accumulation of all this data and more effective and personalized medical treatments 
could be anticipated right for many disorders because we are not just talking about one kind of information we are collecting different kind of omics information along with the clinical information along with uh, epidemiological information and then uh, we we are trying to predict a right path a right path for uh, a patient care so this understanding of uh, you know different types of omics uh, including like patients uh, metabolomics and their genetic makeup in conjugations in conjugation with clinical data will definitely and significantly lead to you know determining uh, predispositions diagnostics uh, prognostics and predictive biomarkers and this path uh, which we are taking in for precision medicine is ultimately going to provide optimal and personalized care for this diverse and uh, you know targeted chronic and acute uh, diseases and this uh, diverse uh, population for for a diverse population right so most of this data that you that is generated uh, are generated randomly because it uses a high throughput system and it it is generated at a very high speed right and then to do analysis of this data it requires a uh, complex computational data processing so that is one of the challenges that anyone any biologist or anyone interested in learning these sort of omics data has to overcome so uh, this process or the process of uh, procedure to generate a structured data set uh, a structured data set where we have labels where we understand the um, the where, where where we have removed the artificial artifact artifacts and understand the biological uh, 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 connection of data that have been generated for a particular uh, uh, particular experiment right so <coughs> sorry so it is important now to understand this kind of structured data the next step uh, after you have processed this data and to be able to visualize this and to be statistically understand what is the important of, importance of this uh, experiment or the data set that you are analyzing yourself so in the context of you know um, uh, current pandemic so scientists around the globe are working to understand this novel coronavirus how it spreads how it evolves uh, and also the genetic sequencing has provided enormous insights so since sars cov2 virus is a is an rna virus it naturally uh, acquires mutation right so these natural uh, so this mutations that are happening at a really uh, fairly consistent rate uh, many of these mutations uh, that are happening within the uh, virus uh, i mean in in the context of biology so they do not they they, they may may not be important in the context of you know uh, uh, the infection but those uh, particular uh, mutations like different type of mutations that we are uh, getting information about could be important for uh, you know understanding that how it spreads or how it is affecting or uh, infecting uh, individuals uh, globally so drawing those relationships out of uh, you know different data sets is some of the things that we do that in, that includes like going through scientific literature then uh, looking at the sequences looking and finding those mutations which are like really uh, connects with the population data with the uh, with the spread of what we are seeing so finding those kind of correlations and then tracing them back to the structure is uh, one of the research that uh, we kind of focus on for infectious diseases and you know this next generation sequencing and, and today we wanted to talk a lot about next generation sequencing data because uh, one of the major objective of this sort of training is to go through and understand this uh, hugely available uh, publicly available data sets so this is a really powerful tool for tracking those mutations as i said genomics and uh, even monitoring for patients uh, infection progression and immune responses such as these uh, so one of the key benefits of ngs is to ability its uh, uh, is its ability to scale so for instance uh, sequencing system can simultaneously sequence more than 100000 samples 
but again the challenge itself is about is is to able to understand and analyze that huge uh, amount of information and that's why we call it like uh, big data so talking about the um, ngs technology and how it connects and you know in the context of the current pandemic and not just in the context of the current pandemic but in the in context of infectious diseases this so this technology is really helpful for understanding diseases such as ebola tuberculosis and uh, papilloma virus so all those uh, uh, infectious disease uh, problems uh, are really uh, uh, can help these ngs data sets are helping really uh, us to gain deeper insights into these uh, these diseases and their progression so um, and this sort of data is really widely available so millions of sequence you saw thousands of genomes that are available in these repositories and these repositories contain are from like ncbi and other uh, joint genomic uh, integration databases are there so these databases are also growing really uh, fast and at, at an exponential speed so in the end in the context of bioinformatics research and bioinformatics research project uh, so what can be done with this data so anyone including you here uh, can find a relevant data set can find a relevant data set and learn how to analyze this data uh, data using different tools and techniques learning about the research method uh, uh to analyze and discover new things and explore new ways finding and gaining insight from this data and apply data science techniques so one of the major uh you know challenge with this data that i've been talking about for quite some time now is that that how do we find patterns and gain insight and learn about the you know uh about the biomarkers that we talked about, learn about the patterns that would give us, you know, that could help us classify patient groups. So we use uh, several AI or uh, multiple AI or um, machine learning algorithms, such as use of support vector machines, logistic regression, and looking for the factors and discriminant analysis we can do to classify two groups. Then we draw decision trees that helps us, uh, uh, you know, again classify uh, <coughs> unsupervised or supervised techniques. So random forest is another method, linear regression, naive base. So these are different types of, uh, you know, machine learning uh, methods that are used to find and gain insights from this sort of data. And in the end, we kind of uh, are exploring the scientific knowledge that we are extracting. And then we are trying to decide or predict and in the end what we are trying to do is uh trying to connect this connect the dots to complete and you know find uh find a solution or complete a story or to complete a research project so um, to talk more about how we do this and what we do in in a research fellowship program and how uh, we kind of go from one step to another uh successfully uh, finding data and converting that data into uh, finding information from that data through these complex methods with ease. Uh, I would like to pass it on, uh, pass it back to Bipsha to talk more about the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohit. I will be sharing my screen right now. And while I'm sharing my screen, uh, you all can see a poll. This poll is to help us know more about you. So we have three questions. The first question is, uh, we would like to know more about you. Please share your research interest with us. So you can put in any of your research interest here. And if you find that it is not mentioned in these five points, you can also mention that in the chat box. The second question is, have you done any bioinformatics internship before? And the third question is, have you worked on any bioinformatics projects before? So as I continue with the slides, please continue putting in your votes. So talking about the research fellowship program, it is typically offered for either three months or six months. If you have already completed any online training 
or have a degree in bioinformatics or are well versed in bioinformatics, we then recommend the three month research fellowship program. This program will help you develop a research proposal and complete the analysis independently while working with a mentor and support from like-minded collaborators. If you are new to bioinformatics and you want to learn as well as develop a research proposal or conduct an independent research project with a potential poster or publication, then the six month research fellowship program is for you. In this program, you will get training, access to ongoing programs and the support of a community as you prepare and complete the research project. Now, I would want to introduce you to a few resources that we have developed for our research fellows and our bioinformatics community in general. So these include training materials, research articles, as well as research projects that you can learn from. The first resource we recommend everyone to start with is the Introduction to Bioinformatics course. This course starts with a survey that helps us learn more about your interests. And then the course explains to you the different applications of bioinformatics in life science research. In the past few weeks, we have also been working on to launch a few blog posts related to bioinformatics internship opportunities, application of NGS in malaria research, as well as a guide on finding omics data for Alzheimer's disease. And shortly, I will show you how to access all of these resources by signing into edu.t-bio.info. You can find the link to the website or the educational portal in the chat box, edu.t-bio.info. Our team has also designed some new projects for our research fellows to learn from before they can start working on their own project like the Ebola virus, COVID-19, liver cancer, and tuberculosis. Every month, our team adds new example projects taken from peer-reviewed publications on different areas of bioinformatics research. So please start by creating a free account on edu.tbioinfo. And now let us go back to the website to view some of these projects. So this is the edu.t-bio.info website. Once you come to this website, you will notice that there are a lot of courses, then there are projects that you all can start exploring. The registration to this website is free and you can register either via your email ID or by using any of the social media accounts. And once you are logged in, you would notice under courses, there's a course called Introduction to Bioinformatics. And that was a course which I was talking about earlier. This course will give you an overview of the different ways the bioinformatics courses are taught here. It's an asynchronous course, which means that it's a course for self-study that you can take at your own pace and time. And to introduce this course, there is a video that you can go through. So I will also be posting the direct link to this course right in the chat box again. So it is necessary if you are intending to join the program or if you are just new to this community to start with the introduction to bioinformatics course as it will give you an overview of the different applications of bioinformatics. We recommend this course for both beginners as well as for researchers and faculty who are part of our bioinformatics community. So you see there's an intro survey and then there are different lectures which are divided into separate sections. So as you go through this course, you will also learn about the other asynchronous courses that you can again take from here and see how the module is designed. Next, coming to the projects that we were talking about. 
So you see that here are the tuberculosis project, the COVID-19 project, liver cancer. And these are not the only projects. If you scroll down, you will find different projects related to oncology as well, even neuroscience. So please take a look through these different projects. And the third resource which I was showing you is our blog platform. So this blog is where we create articles which I just showed you some images of. So for example, this is a very interesting article on the different bioinformatics opportunities that are available. So please feel free to explore the blog section as well. And all of this is available freely to everyone who is a member of the educational portal. And I would also want to invite you all to go ahead and be part of our social media groups and communities. And the reason you should be part of a community like ours is because you are not only getting um, to know a community of students, but you can see the researchers as well as faculty and uh, those who are working at different bioinformatics companies, cancer research institutes all over the world who are part of this community. So this is a free resource and this is open for everyone to go ahead and take part in. So please go ahead and join our groups. We also have a group on Facebook as well. So you can take part in either of these groups and community and also share your ideas and your views with everyone else. Now let's go back to the presentation. I hope that if you have not already created an account, you would be creating an account right now and we would be getting started. So now I would like to explain the research fellowship process with you. And the goal as we know is to come up with our own independent project. So how does this step-by-step -step process work? So this entire process starts with the very basics, the introductory courses that I have shown you. So these courses are based on not just introduction to bioinformatics, but also other omics topics like transcriptomics, which will introduce you to NGS or RNA-seq data analysis, metagenomics, epigenetics, and more. So this will build up your idea about what omics logic is. So you learn the logic from these basic courses. Then you go ahead and get familiar with the projects. Why is it helpful? The projects will help you to learn and to see how others have approached a biological problem and solved that problem. So their approach will help you get a better idea of how you should approach a similar kind of a biological problem, right? And while you're doing step one and two, we recommend you to keep a journal. And how is the journal helpful? You should note down each and everything you're doing in that journal. So we recommend all of our research fellows to either have a Google document or a presentation like I am showing here, where they can record each of the steps they are doing, which means it starts with giving a review of the courses they are doing. It shows that how you are understanding each of the courses and our mentor team can guide you similarly in case you are not understanding something. And you would also understand the different uh, problems or the challenges that you're facing when it comes to developing your project. And it is also very helpful in case you are from a university or an organization which requires you to record each step of the internship process. Now, once you're familiar with the project and you have an idea of the kind of projects you would want to get uh, started with, we recommend the literature review. Now we have uh, in our experience seen that there are two sets of uh, students or interns who come in. Uh, there are a few who already know what kind of project they would want to work on. And there are others who do not know what area they are more interested in, and they might have multiple interests. So the literature review in that case is very helpful to get you familiar with 
the different research techniques and the different multi-omics and bioinformatics research that is going on in that particular area you may be interested in so that you can formulate your own research idea and then work with your mentor on completing that project. The fifth step is of course, making a presentation again like this. This exercise is very important and very soon we will be seeing our own research fellows present some of their projects as well as their progress who have been a part of this research fellowship program for some time or you know longer. So this presentation is going to be a final presentation where you would be presenting your full project and your progress. And then in the sixth step, peer review. So this would not only be reviewed by our team of mentors, but also it would be reviewed by your peers. And we definitely recommend you to share it with your friends and family to make sure that if there is someone who does not understand bioinformatics, your goal in the project is also clear to them. Now, moving on, we are going to see some project presentation. And to start with, I would like to invite our research fellow Kalau Mari to go ahead and share his presentation on subtypes classification of triple negative breast cancer. Kalau Mari, over to you. Ah, thank you. I will share my, my screen. Sure, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, Kalaumari. You can go ahead. Okay, great. I, I'm going to talk about my project that is entitled Classification of Triple Negative Breast Cancer Cell Lines by Gene Expression Analysis of Transmembrane Proteins Using Machine Learning Algorithms. My name is Calomari Mayoral Peña. Just to talk a little about myself, I'm from Querétaro City in Mexico, and I'm a PhD student from the program of biotechnology at Tecnológico de Monterrey. And actually, my PhD is about the development of devices for the diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer. So I have interest in finding new biomarkers that could improve the analysis and the diagnosis of this, this type of disease. Just in order to have some context about the triple negative breast cancer, it represents from 10 to 20% of breast cancer. However, it is uh, highly heterogeneous, so it's difficult to diagnose. There are several subtypes and also, uh, well, the main characteristic of this type of disease is that these breast cancer, they, they have negative response to estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, and also epidermal growth factor receptor. As a result, the, the hormonal and the immune therapies are not very effective and also com is commonly an, an, an aggressive type of disease. So the treatment is difficult and early diagnosis is important in order to have a positive outcome when you are diagnosed with this disease. So, and in order to, to find new biomarkers, well, the type of biomarkers I'm interested on are the membrane biomarkers because, well, they can be used for, for prognostics, to know the prognosis and also to monitor the development of, of different type of cancer. They also are critical in, in they play an important role in, in cellular structure and function and also in the proliferation of cancer cells. And, and also they, they are important as, as a drug target in the pharmaceutical perspective. So for this reason, I decided to generate a question and it says, it is possible to classify breast cancer cells by gene expression analysis of transmembrane proteins using machine learning. 
And well, the hypothesis is that these breast cancer uh, cell lines can be classified in the molecular sub subtypes using the expression of these transmembrane proteins and also implementing the machine learning algorithms. And the methodology consists in when, when in an approach. The first approach is uh, it involves the selection of transmembrane proteins from the annotation of the genes that are present in a data set. Then uh, performing some machine learning analysis using these genes that are selected and then validating these all these genes with, with another data set in order to see if the machine learning and the genes are performing in a proper manner. And for the second approach, in, that, in this approach, the idea is to select genes that are useful for the classification of, of breast cancer, but that are not necessarily uh, transmembrane genes, and then perform the the same type of machine learning analysis and validation in order to get at the end a list of transmembrane genes that are common with both approaches and which could be analyzed as, as candidates uh, for, for diagnosis. And the, the two data sets that I, that I used in this project, and the first one is is based in the article of modeling precision uh, treatment of breast cancer. And the second one is, is a recent uh, data set that was used for the external validation. And it was, uh, it was from the, uh, a professor from Harvard Medical School. Here are the, the accession numbers. And for the preparation, the, the first step was to homogenize the information present in the data sets. Uh, I employed a quantum normalization with a threshold of five, then the annotation and the selection and the analysis and everything was performing the Tower Bioinformatic Research Center, the algorithms and all the analysis. And for the first approach, uh, 160 genes were annotated as transmembrane and they were, they were selected and a principal components analysis was performed. And as you can see, there are some of the groups are easy to identify according to this analysis. And well, it's important to mention that the luminal BC and basal BC, they are normal breast cancer. They are not triple negative breast cancer. And the other ones are negative, triple negative breast cancer and, and non-malignant. Then uh, considering that 160 uh, genes is, is a large number. I decided to reduce the number of, of genes. And for this, I perform a random forest algorithm and I use the 10% of the, of the data set to test the algorithm with an accuracy of 83.3%. And here is the, the criteria. Uh, and mean decrease accuracy bigger or low than two and lower than minus two. And actually I got uh, 40 transmembrane genes according to this feature selection. And as you can see, the groups are, are pretty well separated. So this analysis suggests that uh, the posterior analysis could provide interesting results. So I decided to work with the supervised machine learning analysis using the dimension for the genes. And actually uh, the performance with the first data set wasn't as, as good as expected. However, well, the number of, of samples was reduced. So it causes some difficulties with the algorithm. But during the validation using the, the second data set uh, with a larger number of, of samples to test, well, the, the accuracy was, was improved. And actually, as you can see, it's around 90, 90%. So I think that these, uh, these genes with the machine learning algorithm perform well. 
And then I worked in the second approach. And in the second approach, I consider uh, 40, 14,000 genes uh, from the first data set. And, and I also perform the feature selection using ran random forest. And in that case, I use an accuracy larger than 1.2 or smaller than minus 1.2 because yeah, the, the number uh, were lower in comparison to the, to the other feature selection. And I, as a result, I got 133 genes. And as you can see with the principal component analysis, the groups are pretty well separated. Just the, the ones of, that are breast cancer, basal breast cancer and luminal breast cancer are difficult to separate from the, from the basal and luminal. But in, in general, they look good. So I, I performed the supervised machine learning analysis using the mentioned genes. And the, with the first data set, the, the accuracy was was more was better in that in the in the previous approach, but not as good as as I as I expected. But during the uh, the external validation with the second data set, the the accuracy was was good was over ninety percent. So the all all these machine learning with the genes work pretty well. And then after all these analysis, I decided to check from the, the first approach using these 40 genes from transmembrane proteins and, and then try to find which genes are shared by the two approaches. And according to, to this, there were two transmembrane genes that are shared by two approaches. So I go these two candidates that, that could be useful for for future analysis. So as conclusions, uh, well, the machine learning algorithms that were used uh, were good for the classification of breast cancer cell lines using the gene expression analysis in both of the approaches. And actually the support vector machine algorithm provided better results in comparison to, in comparison to the random forest. Also the machine learning algorithms uh, were validated with with an external data set and but more more external validation with other data set is is recommended in order to to know if the if the results are consistent and also the the genes uh, well I obtained two genes that could be interesting for further analysis in, in the diagnostic area. And also, well, it's important to mention that the, well, it, it, the, the analysis involved only the gene expression. So other aspects of cancer are not considered. Also the accuracy of the machine learning algorithm can be improved by modifying the selection procedure and modifying the, the cutoff value during the feature selection. And also the transmembrane proteins uh, need to be conf confirmed. The expression doesn't mean that the, the protein is present in the cell. So this confirmation is necessary. And well, uh, I was expecting having more than, than two genes, but unfortunately just two, two genes are shared with both approaches. And that's all. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Kalamari, for this excellent presentation. Um, does anyone have any question for Kalamari on this project? You can ask us in the chat box, or you can ask. I him actually directly. have a. I actually have a question, uh, Kalamari. Could you expand a little bit more on uh, why you were interested in this project and what was your previous experience with bioinformatics and what have you learned through this experience? Well, actually, uh, well, the I I I had important limitations uh, with respect to the lab work, so I was trying to find other ways to complement my my research that doesn't involve uh, 
the use of laboratory facilities, and also, well, uh, bioinformatics, I think, is a very important tool that could help in, in improving the research without requiring a, a, a large amount of, of ex, uh, expenditures with re respect of reagents and materials. So I, I had this interest of implementing bioinformatic approaches in order to, to make our, our research more efficient, considering the limitations of resources and facilities. And uh, for this reason, I, I was interested in joining the, this research internship. And actually, I learned a lot about the use of, of these tools. And, and the, I think that the data science perspective is, is very useful because usually the courses about bioinformatics, they just, uh, they just tell you how to use some of the databases, but you don't see all of that in, in, a, in a data science perspective. So I think that this, this perspective is very useful. And I, I got very interesting results that I, I expect to continue working on. Uh, here Thank I have... you. Uh, one second before we get to those questions. My other question is, so what, what are you planning to do with this project after you're done with this program? Well, uh, I would like to, to continue with this project in order to generate some uh, a paper. So I was thinking that maybe it would be a good idea to continue working in the internship or to, to, to yeah, to, to enter to the internship again in order to continue with some parts of the project in order to, to generate uh, a publication. Okay, thank you, Kalamari. Here I have a question from Daido. He's asking, have you tested other ML methods such as GBM or XBoost? I, I, I tested, I haven't tested all the machine learning method. I just tested linear discriminant analysis. And this was the other method that I tested. And the, in comparison to, to the random forest and, and support vector machine, the performance was lower. So I decided to not continue performing this analysis. But yeah, I, I just tested these three methods. Uh, linear discriminant analysis, uh, support vector machine, and, and random forest. Maybe in the future I will I will test other other methods. Uh, thank you for your question, Daido, and thank you for answering Kalamari. We have one more question from Janani, and then we'll move on. Uh, the question is: How did you decide which aspects of gene expression to analyze with machine learning? Well. Uh, in, 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 in my case, well, the transmembrane proteins were relevant because uh, in the type of devices that I'm, I'm working on, it's easy to separate the cells using these, uh, these transmembrane uh, proteins. So in, in my case, I was, well, the focus was according to the type of, of project that I'm developing. So, so I think that this is the the reason why I did the, what, uh, that I decide to to take this perspective. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Kalamari. And I would now like to invite Sonalika to go ahead and share her review of the liver cancer project. Sonalika, and thank you, Kalamari. Thank you.
Good evening, everybody. Is my screen visible? Yes, Sonalika, we can see your screen. Okay, so I'm um, Sonalika, we cannot hear you clearly. Uh, your connection must be uh, disrupting. Uh, hi, Bipsha. So maybe we can move on to the next presentation. Meanwhile, Sonalika may can. Sure, uh, sure. So I'm sorry that Sonalika is having some trouble uh, regarding her network issue. So I would like to invite Avio Bruno to share his project on identification, characterization, and expression analysis of cell wall related genes as primary targets for efficient biofilm production in sorghum bicolor. So, Avio, please go ahead. And Avi, also please make sure to unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, Avio. Yes, we can hear you and also see your screen. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. okay thank you. <clears throat> I'm called Bruno Avio. Uh, my presentation is on identification, characterization, and expression analysis of cell wall related genes as primary targets for efficient biofuel production in sorghum bicolor. I'll not give a uh, background to the study. Uh, my, as I had prepared this presentation with focus of only providing uh, providing feedback on the progress that I've made. I'm having four objectives. I'm going to present mainly the progress on one objective. On the fourth objective, which I, I'm looking at characterization of transcriptome pattern of sorghum cell wall related genes under moisture stress and under differing developmental growth stages. Under dif differing developmental growth stages, I'm having three, three different data sets, uh, 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 three different data sets from uh, uh, looking at transcription data at vegetative and reproductive stage of sorghum. So from the first data set, it was from the study by Makita et al 2015, uh, where transcription data was taken uh, at uh, reproductive, reproductive stage, mainly taking transcription data from spike late and stem and from seed at harvest maturity. And uh, here they collected, uh, they had transcription data on uh, 10, 10 different samples. On the second data set, transcript, transcriptome data was taken from a 20 day old leaf. And they, they, they had 10 SRNF, SRI, SRIA files. Uh, the third data set uh, looked into a transcription data from uh, vegetative and, and reproductive stage. On uh, sub, uh, subset of the study two uh, of, st of the same study, uh, uh, the, the interest was to, to look at gene expression analysis under various abiotic stresses with focus on drought. And this, uh, the data was obtained from, uh, from Douglas et al. 2011, where uh, SRA, uh, SRA sequence data was collected at, uh, at uh, seedling stage from shoot and roots uh, under, under four different treatments. I'll give uh, uh, the presentation will mainly 
provide analysis for subsection two, which is 4.2. So, uh, with this study, what was done was that the uh, uh, seeds of a single genotype, uh, seed of one genotype that is uh, a BT, uh, BTX623 was planted, was planted and, and was planted and once uh, after the third day, once they have already, once the seeds have already germinated, the seeds, uh, the seedlings were transferred into uh, a control chamber room and kept in there till the eighth day. And on the eighth day, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the seedlings were put into uh, the seedlings were put into four different groups. And in group one, uh, uh, the seedlings were sprayed with abscisic acid, abscisic acid. And group two was sprayed with uh, sodium hydroxide. Uh, group three was sprayed by polyethylene glycol. And, and the, last, the, the last group was sprayed with, uh, uh, with water. Basically, sodium hydroxide Sodium hydroxide acted as a control for abscisic acid, and water acted as a control for poly, uh, polyethylene uh, glycol. So uh, uh, after the treatment, uh, 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 RNA transcript were, uh, were, were, uh, were, were, were obtained from root and shoot, from, from root and shoot. Um, uh, uh, from root and shoot with uh, each group having three replicates, as you can see from, uh, from my diagram. So I, I performed an analysis, uh, basically the analysis that I've conducted up to now is more of uh, an exploratory, an exploratory uh, kind of analysis. So I, I did uh, gene expression analysis where uh, the transcript were mapped onto the, uh, uh, were, were, were mapped using Boltai, uh, Boltai 2T. And I, from the transcript, from the expression analysis that was, uh, 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 that I did, I obtained uh, over 24,000 24, genes. And these were designated as, as LOX, SOBIC, and then uh, tRNA, uh, as, uh, as I've uh, summarized, as I've summarized it, summarize, uh, summarize on, the, on the slide. So at the beginning, I first, I first uh, did a, a, a test. I first performed a test, a test, a test analysis where uh, a subset, a subset of, uh, a subset of, uh, of uh, six SRA files were analyzed, and this, uh, uh, these six SRA files uh, uh, were from, were from two, two different treatments. That is sodium hydroxide and PEG, <clears throat> sodium hydroxide and PEG, and I observed that uh, 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 from the principal component analysis that I conducted, uh, they were nicely separated into two groups based on the uh, based, based, based on the treatment condition. And similarly, I did uh, uh, a cluster cluster analysis, and the same observation was observed. Uh, uh, the same observation was observed. I I tried to assess uh, the relationship between samples from the same treatment. Uh, so this is from uh, th this is from uh, sodium hydroxide and PEG, and I observed that there is a uh, there is a strong relationship between the um, between the gene expression pattern under the uh, between the gene expression pattern of uh, of of uh, of samples uh, of samples that were treated uh, uh, that were treated uh, that had the same that had the same treatment. Which shows that the data is uh, the quality of the data is quite good. So I I, I went ahead and looked into and I looked into the uh, the distribution the distribution of the of the data set uh, on box plot and observed that uh, there are some there are some out, some outliers 
or uh, uh, some outliers in all the in all the in all the samples. But uh, uh, what I observe is that the the median of the median of all data were 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 uh, were quite related, and the and the uh, and the extent of the variation uh, extent of the variation in the uh, uh, under the uh, under the treat under the different treatment condition were quite related. <clears throat> so I went ahead and now looked into the all uh, all the twenty four SRL files and perform a similar kind of analysis that I did with six SRL files and observed that uh, uh, I observed uh, uh, using the principal component analysis. I observed uh, um, I observed. Uh, uh, I observe four different sets of clusters, uh, four different sets of clusters. And when I performed uh, a, a dendrogram, uh, when I performed, uh, the, uh, when I went ahead and did this on, on dendrogram, I observed a, a similar trend, the similar observation that, I, that, uh, that the principal component uh, revealed was also revealed here. And, uh, we had two, uh, it showed two major clusters, two major clusters. Basically, uh, this split the data based on the, uh, based on the plant, uh, based on the plant organ. So this, uh, this major cluster basically are shoots and this, uh, this, these clusters are basically roots. And in between here, I have got, uh, uh, Four clusters, which are which are separated based on the treatment, the kind of treatment. So from this, I observe that I can really get very interesting uh, genes, uh, uh, differentially expressed genes. Uh, first of all, between between the organs, and and uh, uh, and among us the treatment, uh, among us the 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 among us the treat, uh, among us the four, among us the four types of treatment. So I'm hoping that uh, with this data, I can get very interesting, uh, very interesting genes that relates to cell wall, uh, 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 that relates that relates to cell wall, uh, that are related to cell wall, plant cell wall. So I did the, I went ahead and looked at uh, looked at the the, the nature of uh, variation, uh, the nature of variation uh, on the box plot. I still I observed. Uh, the the extent of the the extent of the the variation uh, under the different under the different plant organ and treatment level were almost the same were were uh, almost the same uh, but uh, the, from the from the root I observed uh, relatively that there could be some outliers that I, that uh, uh, that needs to be looked into and probably trim off. But the shoots looks relatively okay. I, I, my focus. I, I, I went ahead and tried to look into uh, finding out uh, uh, which genes are, di uh, are expressed differently under the under 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 the different treatment under the different treatment different types of treatment and different organs. I. Uh, this is the pipeline I followed. Unfortunately, I did I perform this analysis, and the the output that I obtained, uh, the the folders were empty, and I failed to understand where the challenge was. So, I from the analysis that I've conducted, this is uh, this is where this is where I ended. But uh, 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 the the expression. Uh, the the genes that I uh, the, uh, that are indicated in my gene expression table, they in terms of location locks, uh, locks and other and other types of names. So uh, once once I obtain the genes that are differentially expressed, uh, the genes that are differentially expressed, I can search for the the gene names from uh, from the Sorghum gene database and. Once I obtain those genes, I believe I should be able to go and perform my gene ontology analysis and try to um, identify those genes that are strongly re related with a cell wall uh, that are strongly related that that are related to 
uh, cell wall uh, that participate in in cell wall uh, cell wall uh, regulation. And, uh, and another challenge that I faced was that uh, in the uh, um, uh, for for the subsection one where I'm looking at uh, where I'm looking at uh, gene expression under different growth stages, I'm having three different uh, sets of files. I I have no idea how these three different sets of files can be uh, can be combined as one in order to in order to have as in order to conduct perform analysis as one as one set of experiment. So those were my challenges that I faced during the. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oweo. It's uh, really exciting to see the progress with your project and you're getting some insight. So thank you for sharing that. About the technical part of your question, how to combine multiple uh, data sets together. All you need to do really is just to create one single table with all of those links and then use NCBI upload tool so that you will get all of them combined together. What you probably need to consider afterwards, however, is how to normalize the data so that it actually is consistent, maybe removing some batch effects. And so these are things that we can address in our next meeting one-on-one -on -one to kind of discuss some of these challenges. But I think overall, uh, you're off to a great start. It would be really exciting to see uh, what else you uh, find in your data. Uh, but so far, I think it looks really good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avio, and thank you, Ida. So now I would like to uh, invite Sonalika back. I think her issues are solved. So Sonalika, you can go ahead and share your uh, project again. Good evening, everybody. I'm really sorry for the glitch. I'm Sonalika Ray, currently pursuing master's in bioinformatics from Punjab University, Chandigarh. Uh, today, I'm here to discuss the major findings of hepatocellular carcinoma, which is abbreviated as HCC. And I would be shedding light on the risk factors involved, gene mutations, treatments, and what are the different scopes of research in this field. So what is HCC? It is the most common form of liver cancer. It is the second leading cause of cancer death in the, in the world, and there are between 6 lakh to 1 million new HCC cases in the world annually. So this is clearly still an important area of basic science, clinical science, and drug development. The highest incidence and mortality of HCC are observed in East Asia, Africa, Europe, and in the USA. Now I would like to discuss a few of the risks. factors which are associated with HCC. So patients with consumption are have the major B virus or hepatitis C virus. Uh, then NAFLD Hi Sonalika, we have lost you again. NASH, that is non-alcoholic sets, the polymorphisms in the in these three genes which I've mentioned have. Hi, Sonalika, uh, we are keeping on like losing you. Um, I mean, it's not very clear to NASH us. NASH and HCC incidence. Another risk factors are cirrhosis from bio. Hi, Sonalika, we have lost you again. Can you hear me? Can you please go on? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah, yeah. So we keep on continue to lose you. So your connection is like fluctuating. Maybe you can go a little slow because we kind of mixed out on a lot of the things while you are explaining the risk factors. Thank you.
Hi, Sonalika. I think that uh, because of your issue, we would be looking at your project in the next time. I mean, we cannot hear you at all. So I would like to pass it on to the next person. So in our next meeting, uh, you can go ahead and again address everybody. So thank you so much, Sonalika. I'm sorry that your connection is not working out. And I would like now like to invite Fawzan Ahmed to go ahead and give us a review of his progress so far. So Fawzan is joining us uh, just since the last week. So what we are going to do is see how he has progressed and he's also going to introduce himself to us. So Fawzan, please go ahead. And also please unmute yourself. Thank uh, you. Yeah, so can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. And I hope you can see my screen as well, right? Yeah, we can see your screen as well. Okay, so my name is Fawzan Ahmed. Um, I am a final year student in BTEC Bioinformatics at Amity University in Noida. So I just joined this program about 10 days ago. So at this point, I'm really just going through the courses, I'm trying to get a grasp of uh, what I can do and what is available. Okay, so I started off with the introduction to bioinformatics course, um, where I learned the basic concepts uh, involved in bioinformatics, such as um, whole transcript, what is available over here, and what we base what we are basically doing in bioinformatics and why it's important. So there are many different areas of study within this field as well, such as, and one of the fields in which I'm interested in is in personalized medicine. And hopefully once I'm done with the courses, I can pursue a project related to personalized medicine. Um, and over here, we basically consider genomic and metabolomic data to provide the to provide a suitable treatment to a group of patients. And in personalized medicine, we also look at uh, diagnosing a disease or a condition um, um, at an earlier stage so we can treat it on time. Um, this is especially useful in cancer. And this is enabled by the vast uh, amount, of, amount of data, which is the genomic data that is available. The other areas where we can also apply it is in environmental science. Um, we can apply it in microbial communities, which is known as the metagenomics. So this is basically the summary of uh, what I went through in introduction to bioinformatics. The second course that I'm also pursuing now is epigenetics. Um, this is a course that I've actually never studied. Um, so this is the first time I'm actually going through what epigenetics really is. Um, I've heard of the term, but I never really uh, studied it in depth. So it's uh, exciting for me to see this. Um, I just started this course a few days back, actually. And so far, I just learned that it's a field that studies interactions between genes and products that um, bring phenotypes into existence. And this is a field that has been linked to, um, this uh, epigenetics is actually linked to mechanisms that uh, uh, affect the stability and the folding of the DNA. Um, I've also, I'm also at the same time exploring the T-Bio info platform that I, that I recently gained access to. Apart from the, that, I've also, I'm also planning on starting the transcriptomics course and maybe along the way make some progress and hopefully uh, plan a project that, uh, that is uh, useful. So that's it for now, actually. Thank you so much, Fazan. Thank you for giving us this review.
and it's good to see your progress in the last 10 days. So now I would want to invite Swati to talk about her progress. So Swati has been already a part of one of our Omics Logic programs and she has some experience utilizing the tools. So she has also joined the research fellowship program to work on her own independent project. So we will be hearing from Swati. So Swati, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I hope I'm audible and my screen is visible. Sure, Swati. Yes, we can see you and also hear you. See your screen. Uh, Please go ahead. So to introduce myself, uh, I'm Swati, uh, third year undergraduate. I'm studying at MIT ADT University, pursuing bioengineering. I'm very, very interested in pursuing bioinformatics for my higher studies as well. I don't have any research experience in bioinformatics, but I have taken a summer training uh, at Pine Bio, and I wish to pursue a project too with this internship opportunity. So I'll just be sharing um, what I have covered so far in the course. All right. Um, so I covered the um, R and Python bioinformatics course modules. So it started off with how uh, we import various tables, Excel files, and um, CSV files into both R and Python. Um, I learned to split data as a data frame and also in the form of a matrix. Uh, so the next part of this module was pre-processing of the data, which basically means that most of the times in the data, there are any values, basically empty values or zero values, which interfere with the analysis methods. So it's important to get rid of this before running your pipeline. Um, so some of the theory that was covered in these modules were um, basic theory on DNA structure and function. And of course, uh, the first step in the central dogma, which is replication. Uh, the course also talked about how uh, kinase, uh, so CDKs um, play an important role in controlling initiation of the replication process and how various uh, proteins are involved in the elongation and termination of this very extensive process as well. Um, the highlight for me of both these courses were learning about Bioconductor, which basically offers various libraries like BioString and Decipher, which was completely new to me. Uh, so as far as I have learned, they are used for memory efficient string containers, string matching algorithms, and other utilities for manipulation of large biological sequences or sets of sequences. As a part of an assignment and exercise in the course, I use these libraries to find length of a given DNA sequence, the frequency of the bases in the sequence, and also the reverse complement of uh, the sequence. Yeah, that's my progress so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swati. So now I would like to thank all of our research fellows who took the time to talk about their progress and share with us what they have done so far and also talk about their projects. So what we do from time to time, the research fellowship program is not just a program where you come and do your own research project or get training. What we want to do is enable you to not only prepare that research project, but take it further. So we want to enable you, we want to make sure that your research project is uh, getting the word of the mouth. So we utilize our social media channels. Here you can see, Simai is one of our research fellows. She recently completed her fellowship program and her project. And we have featured her in this blog post that gives her uh, access to a wider audience who can learn about her project. 
Similarly, we also have Dilara, who has joined along with Simai. They both are from the Bachishir University in Turkey. And we keep on featuring students like them who perform and do well in a program like this. So the research fellowship program not only comes with a project that you design on your own, but there is also a certification that you receive at the end of this course, which states how you have performed during this entire period of three months, six months, or any other period that you are choosing to do the research fellowship. So I welcome you to go ahead and check out and also there are other posts on our blog, which I had mentioned earlier, where you can see why other participants are recommending these programs. And I want to again continue to invite you to go ahead and join our channel. And now I have a last poll for all of you that I would be launching in a minute. So if you are intending to join the research fellowship or you have just joined right now, you can see the poll which asks you a question. What is your expectation from this research fellowship training? Then the second question is how many hours per week can you dedicate to this training? This is very important when you are starting to work on your own research project. And what are your future goals? Whether you want to work in the industry, which is a bioinformatics industry for a company, or you're looking forward to work in academia, or if you have any other goals. So please put in your poll result that way. And the fourth question is, what did you think of today's session? So please go ahead and share your results. And I will quickly check the chat box. So there are a few questions on how can I join the research fellowship program? So the first step to join the research fellowship program is to sign up for the program. So as the poll is going on, I will go ahead and make sure that I can show you how to join this program. So I hope that you all can see my screen. So this is the link to join the program. So There are also scholarship opportunities for students who are in need of scholarships. So we do have a few scholarship opportunities and I would be sending you the links to those scholarship opportunities after this session. And you can also reach out to me marketing at find.bio in case you have any specific question regarding joining this program. So the research fellowship program is open not only for individual students in fact you can also join with your peers and work on a group project right now the project that i showed you on alzheimer's are by a student who are working on in a group along with a researcher and they are together collaborating on that alzheimer's project so let us go back to the blog and take a look at it so maybe we can go through it together and I will be able to show you how that is going on. So all of these projects or any of these projects you can either do on your own along with the mentor support that we would be providing. And going forward, you can also collaborate with others. So there is a question if some research project is going to be published, who will be the author? So in this research projects, you are, the one, uh, you are the author of these projects because what we are helping you do is come up with your own project. So you are going to be the authors while the rest of the things that could be uh, our team, like your mentor could be a co-author in that project. But publication is something which is a very long drawn out process. So in three months or six months, it is not always possible to come up with a full fledged publication. So what we try to do first uh, is to make sure that you can come up with a project like you saw that Kalaumari has presented or Avio has presented a project which you can then work towards a publication. And often the challenge is to find the right data sets or to find the right steps of analysis. And that is where most of your time will go in in figuring out in the next 
three months or six months, like how to make sure that you're getting everything right for the project. So I've put the link to this Omics project, uh, Omics blog post in the chat box. And I will also be answering a few of the questions. So there is a question from Faria. She's asking, can a student of undergrad biotech apply for this fellowship or should we wait for the completion of her BSc? So right now, just taking an example of the Alzheimer's project, this project is being done by two students who are in a high school level. So they both are high school students, Andres and Netra, and they are doing this project. So this project will give you an understanding of the kind of data sets that they're using, the approach that they have taken to do this project. And this actually is open source. So any of you can create an account on EduTY Info Portal and read about this project. So you would see what kind of publications they have been using and what they are trying to achieve with this project. So anyone starting from a high school to any kind of post-graduation, post-doc level can come and join the research fellowship program. We have participants who join us from all over the world who come from different educational backgrounds. So everyone is welcome to join. And as I showed you while I was presenting earlier, we follow that step-by-step -step process where we start with the very basic courses and go in a step-by-step -step process where you learn about the logic, learn about the data, learn where you can get that kind of data, identify projects which are similar to yours, do literature review, find the kind of project topic that you would want to work in along with your mentor. So this is a program that comes with a full mentor support. So you work with someone from our team who would be able to uh, work on this project. So hello, Farida. Uh, regarding your application, if you're already a part of another program and you still want to apply for this scholarship, so we will be having like a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you again and decide whether that is something that we can offer for you. So please take your time to go through all of these free resources that are available to you. Please go through the introduction to bioinformatics course. And if you are applying for uh, the research fellowship program, what we would want to learn more about you is like, what is your area of interest? So doing the introduction to bioinformatics course is going to be very helpful because the intro survey will tell us a lot about what you want to do. So this program is not about the projects that we are offering, but it is about what you are interested in pursuing, not only right now, but also in the future. So please feel free to join us. And if there are no more questions, so I would like to thank everyone for attending today's session and Welcome you all again to join our programs and follow us on our social media. So thank you everybody for joining us today and have a great week.